Children are welcome to go to their children's church. Matt, where are you guys going to be? In the room? Down in the basement, in the cool of the basement. So they can go this way and scoot their way down there. Friends, let's pray together. Lord, as we come now before you together, come to your word, would you pour out yourself, give us yourself, and meet us, Lord, in your own name. On Monday this past week, I had a, an opportunity that I had long been hoping for. I had the opportunity to take my son, Ian, and go and visit a longtime friend, a mentor to me, uh, Monsignor, retired Monsignor, who has a, a, a lovely little bachelor's pad on the sea in Kennebunkport overlooking the, the waters. And my Monsignor friend, this is he's one of these brilliant people who is so humble that only slowly over the years does it leak out all the incredible things he's done in life. One of those is that he was for 10 years the head of the North American College in the Vatican. Now this is a lot of fun because you get a lot of stories. You get the story about the time when Mother Teresa came to see John Paul II and Mother Teresa said to John Paul II, you know the Vatican, this is the home of the church. There really should be some place here that cares for the homeless. And John Paul said, you know, you're right, there should be. But the Vatican is, is tiny and it's like uber prime real estate. So he says to her, go find a spot. So she goes and she finds a spot and she says to him, what if we put it over there? And he says, done. And the whole bureaucracy just got undercut completely by the fact that John Paul II and Mother Teresa were friends and were together in spirit. He told me the story about when Billy Graham came. Billy Graham came to visit with John Paul II because he was friends of Rotiwa, was, was, was Pope. And so my friend said, hey, let's get Billy Graham to come talk to the clergy in the North American College. So Billy Graham comes to them, and, he, and in essence, he says to them, you guys are really on to something with this continuity of the faith from the ancient all the way to now thing, but we know how to preach it better, which is pretty, pretty good and pretty true, right? Pretty right on. So this time, Monsignor Murphy told Ian and I the story of what happened when he went to defend his doctoral dissertation. Now, his doctoral dissertation was entitled Action for Justice as Constitutive of the Gospel. This is 1971-ish, right? So this, these are hot times. So he's wrestling with this question, action for justice as constituting the gospel, bringing the kingdom of God into manifestation in the world. That was the title of his dissertation. And he says, you know, you have a dissertation advisor, and all along he's been sending chapters to his advisor, and his advisor's been saying, no, that's good, that's good, that's good. So he gets there that day, and he reads the thing, defends it, and his advisor stands up after he sits down. His advisor says, this is completely mistaken. I disagree with this completely. He says, love is constitutive of the gospel. So my friend is sitting there going, well, I kind of wish you'd told me this a while back, right? Somewhere along the way, somewhere in the process. But he was saved that day because there was a cardinal who I don't know who he is, but he was a big shot, and he was there. He took an interest in it, so he had shown up. So he stood up uninvited. And he said, I think he's right. So in the end, they pass him with honors. But several years later, my friend, the Monsignor, writes an article for a major Catholic theological journal entitled, Charity is Constitutive of the Gospel. And his whole life, he's been wrestling with this question. Is it primarily love? Is it primarily justice? Is it both? Are they in conflict? Do they simply work together? I promised a few weeks ago that in this graduation season, I would quote to you all my favorite emerging theologian. My favorite emerging theologian is my son, Ian. And he wrote in his senior thesis paper this past month, a month ago, this closing paragraph. In reflecting the love of Christ, we as Christians can live in God's larger story of redemption. Sorry, dad moment. 
and bring the world a step closer to the kingdom of God realized in human relationship. It is a freeing and exciting vision for engagement that inspires active living instead of passive reaction and reasserts a fundamental truth of Christianity, that being a Christian involves actively, actively working to better the lives of those around you. Oscar Romero, I think, offers the best summary of what Christian social living should be when he says, quote, a gospel that does not provoke crisis, a gospel that does not disturb, a word of God that does not touch the concrete sin of the society in which it is being proclaimed. What kind of a gospel is that? Indeed. Hallelujah. Hear, hear. Friends, when the church is not in these places, woe to the church. But when the church is in these places, then isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? And I want to say today, the core thing today is, isn't it amazing to be a part of a body in which it's even possible to wrestle with which one is primary, love or justice? Isn't that by itself amazing? The fact that we would be the people who could even ask the question. And we are not just some group of people gathered on a hillside for the fun of it, although it is great fun. We are actually mystically, spiritually, and truly connected to the love which flows from the very center of all that is. And we are indeed the body of that one who in love enacted perfect justice and died that we might be forgiven and new life might be birthed. And simply to be able to even wrestle positively with these things is an incredible privilege. So this morning, we want to walk a little bit in a moment where Jesus is trying to get his disciples to see what a great thing it is. I always used to think as, as a boy when we'd read the story of Jesus going across the sea and, you know, the storm comes up, and it's quite a storm, and the language is very strong that describes the storm. We'll hear that in a minute. And then, you know, they wake him up, and they're scared, and he gets up, and he quiets it all, and he looks at him, and he goes, don't you have any faith? I've always thought that moment was a, was a bit overdone by Jesus, to be honest with you. I mean, he does not promise us that we won't face trials, Right? As a matter of fact, if anything, if anything, he promises us that we will face more trials for being a part of the birth of the new heaven and the new earth and God's new kingdom breaking into space and time and history. If anything, there's going to be more trial, not less. So I've always thought, come on, Jesus, of course they're scared, right? It's natural. It's finally clicked for me what, what he was on to, why, why he said that to them. If you back up, we hear that he told them the parable of the sower and such wonderful things as the sower sows the seed. That's the word of God sown out. Jesus tells us in another parable that the, that the seed is the word of God. And it's, and it's our job to sow the seed. It's our job to create an environment where the seed can be nurtured, after that, what do we do? After that, we go take a nap. We get on the pillow, in the stern. We get some rest. The farmer goes, the farmer sleeps, the farmer rises, the farmer carries on with those other things that are good in life, and God grows the seed. And there's this wonderful freedom in that. And there's this, there's this wonderful sense of the seed is alive, and the word of God has power. So trust it, lean into it, and let it, and be alive. And Jesus told them that parable, and he's saying to them, you know, what we're a part of here is bigger than us. We're out sowing the seeds. We're creating a community that nurtures them, and God is the one doing this great thing. Take confidence in God. And then he tells them the next one. He tells them the parable where he says, what can we compare the kingdom of God to? He says, it's like the teeniest seed of all, the mustard seed. Where I grew up in quasi-rural North Carolina, there was this wonderful farm store down the road, Wash Davis. 
And back in the days before Wash Davis figured out how much money yuppies would pay for Carhartts, it was truly a farm place. And you could go in there, and they had these big vats of seed. And as a boy, I used to get in trouble every time because I'd go in there and I'd sift the seeds in my hands. And, you know, some of them are big and some of them are little. And it's hot as blazes, and you stick your hand down in there, and it's cool. The mustard seeds are truly tiny. And when you stick your hand down in there, they get under your fingernails. They're so little. The bean seeds are, I don't know, a thousand times larger. These teeny little seeds. And yet, Jesus says, they grow up to be the biggest, bigger than all the garden plants, and its branches reach out, and the birds come and they nest. That's an image from the ancient Near East of kingdoms. Those, those tyrannical rulers of the ancient Near East, they would say, my kingdom's like a mighty tree. Jesus is saying this kingdom is similar and different. It's different because the seed is the tiniest little seed of all, this word of God. But it becomes the greatest and the biggest, and the birds come from wherever and everywhere and all different kinds, and they take rest and they take refuge. So Jesus has tried to get them to see you're a part of something bigger than yourself. And then he takes a next step. He takes them on mission with him. So we're told on that day when evening had come, which to a Jew meant the new day is beginning. Jesus is a master of symbolic acts. So as the new day begins, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. We're over here, we're in homeland, we're all in the, you know, in the thing, in the covenant, in the family, we're going over there where they aren't. Let's go to the other. Let's go on mission to the other. And then catch Mark's language. Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. All the Gospels, every word is chosen carefully. And Mark especially, if you get little, little descriptors, knowing that Mark's is so short and tight, you wake up, you pay attention. Leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Jesus is modeling this sense of urgency, this sense of immediacy, this sense of the absoluteness of the call that he makes to us. He calls to us, he says, good Billy Graham fashion, just as you are, come to me. Just as you are, give up everything. I cut through all of it. So just as he is, they get in the boat, they go across, and then Jesus, very naturally, goes and falls asleep in the stern. Why? Well, he's probably legitimately just beat. He's also doing a highly symbolic act where he's mimicking Jonah in order to riff off of the Jonah story. Right? Let's walk down that road a little bit. So off they go, just like in Jonah, a great windstorm arrives. Off they go, just like in Jonah, it's a ferocious storm. The waves were breaking into the boat. The word is literally they were laying hold of the boat. It's like the storm has a mind of its own. It's like it's out to get them. So the boat was already filling. Just like Jonah, Jesus is asleep underneath. Just like Jonah, the panicked sailors wake him up. Of course they do. And then completely not like Jonah, Jesus does not say, it's my fault, cast me into the sea. Jesus gets up and he says, what? You horrible world, I wish I'd never made you. You're so wrong. Only spirit is good. He says, peace, be still. Peace, be still. Don't you love it? I mean, the sea, the sea is sitting there and it's saying to itself in good Romans 8 fashion, the sea is sitting there and it's saying to itself, not again, the prophet of God. I mean, you know, in the sea, we're told in Romans 8 that the, that the creation itself yearns to be set free, that the creation groans in some mysterious way to be set free into the freedom of the children of God, the creation itself. And the sea is like, what are you doing, Jesus? You know, this is the mission. You're supposed to be over there doing this thing so we can get set free. And Jesus gets up and he says, no, no, peace be still. He says, no, no, this is not the prophet gone wrong like Jonah was, where you guys had to correct him. This is the prophet and more than a prophet, 
going on the mission. This is the prophet and more than the prophet showing how the church will go out and go forward and the branches will reach way out and all kinds of people will come into it and the kingdom of God will come in God's way, in God's time with Jesus' return eventually. But this is the way, oh, see, that you're going to be set free. So peace, be still. And the sea is still, just like it will be before the throne in the end, which is an image of the fullness of creation having been achieved. Because in the beginning, the Holy Spirit hovers over the bathos, the deep, and the primeval, primal chaos, and brings order. And Jesus is doing it all over again. He's making a new creation. So he looks at his disciples and he says, really, guys? Really? All these things we've been doing, all these things I just taught you, and you think God's going to let it all crash on one little storm? One little storm's going to upend the whole flow of what God's doing? The boat, that's a B-O-A-T for those of you not from the South. The, the, <laughs> thank you. The boat... Um, you're from Tidewater, Virginia. It's a boat. It's a boat. The boat. Actually, I love that, actually. So, the boat has been adopted historically by the church. It's the ark reinstated. The church is the boat. It's the ark carrying people to the new world. This story has been adapted by Christians both for their individual struggles of life Jesus is with me in the storm, legitimate. And for the larger mission, we are going forward. And we are moving towards a new creation. The church has long adapted this story and held it dear. And friends, I want to say, Jesus is bigger than even we know. Jesus is so much bigger than even we know. And he's doing more. And he's able. And we can trust him. We will not be immune to pain and struggles and griefs. One of our families this week has had profound grief. Profound grief. We'll have a service tomorrow at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge for Linus Erickson, 21 years old. Jesus does not promise us that we will not face troubles and sufferings and twists and turns, but he does open up a new life such that even though our stories are strained and fragile, hope remains. And We live through and forward while appropriately grieving as well. A couple weeks ago, Jennifer Kiefer shared a little bit of her story of of growing up in a kind of a church where the understanding, say, of this story was that Jesus is basically telling his creation off. And she shared how it wasn't all that helpful. And this morning, I invited Jennifer just to come and share briefly for a few minutes about her dreams for the body of Christ, and then to lead us together in our sermon closing prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yeah, so if you weren't here a couple of weeks ago, um, I shared my journey, um, my tenuous connection to God did not actually involve a relationship with Jesus, even though I've been a Christian all my life, my understanding of God was um, a wrathful God the Father, and I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know him in a relational way. And so um, the pain and the trauma and the struggle of that landed me in a psychiatric hospitalization for a week, six years ago. And God woke me up to him in his fullness and dazzled me with his love in that space and set my feet on a path of exploring who is Jesus to me today, not 
not the figure 2,000 years ago who transactionally set me free from death, but on a day-to-day, who is Jesus? And the two themes that um, he kept highlighting for me were compassionate curiosity and open hands. And I didn't know how to be compassionately curious because all I knew was the stern wagging finger. And I didn't know how to hold open hands because all I knew was white knuckled striving. And so it's been a process of six years. I'm still on that path. I'm still learning. I don't have the answers, but I just wanted to share for a couple minutes what that's looked like in my interior life and then how God has translated that to me for how I engage the world. Um, Two main psychological tools that he used, something called DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy, and IFS, Internal Family Systems, both emphasize compassionate curiosity and open hands, which I didn't know about when I was already hearing those words. Um, Have anybody read the book Boundaries for Your Soul by Alison Cook? Excellent book. It takes this psychological tool of internal family systems and interprets it with an explicitly Christian gospel lens. Where is Jesus in this process? So I'll be very brief, but, um, and I won't do it justice. But in general, I've learned that my emotions can be grouped into three main categories. There's manager emotions, which were those harsh and critical perfectionist voices that sent me to the hospital. And they're the ones um, that want to control And then there's firefighter emotions, and those are the ones that want to put out the fires of big feelings. And the way they do that is through um, distraction or numbing. So when I'm trying to run to things like eating for comfort or binge watching, things that in moderation are just fine, but in excess can become addictions. And the third group of emotions are exiles, and those were the ones that I was trying to push far away from me, my painful and hurting parts. And what Jesus showed me in this interior process of inviting him in to meet all of these emotions was to those harsh managers, his rebuke was peace, be still. And to those firefighters and those exiles, his invitation was, your beloved, come back, come back and let let me touch you, let me heal you, let me tell you how much I love you. And so what was interesting is once I moved beyond looking internally and I looked at the gospels with these new fresh eyes of this Jesus is real. He's with me today. That's how he interacted with three main groups of people in the gospels. Those managers, the harsh controlling voices, aren't they like the Pharisees and Jesus? um, His rebuke for them was we see in Matthew 23, Um, He had seven rebukes for them, and it was basically peace be still. It was where you're putting up boundaries to people's belovedness. I want you to stop that. He says, you put heavy burdens on people's shoulders and you don't help them. And our message two weeks ago was about Jesus' yoke being light. And he says, you emphasize these fine little piggy points of the law. You tithe on your herb gardens but you neglect the weightier matters of the law. And the first weightier matter of the law that he names is justice and mercy and faithfulness. But to uh, the firefighters, those would be the sinners, you know, the ones that the Pharisees were scandalized that he was spending time with, the, the tax collectors and the drunks and the prostitutes. He said, I see you. I'm coming to your house. I'm going to be with you. And in response to that profound being seen and being known and being loved, they responded, they repented. Zacchaeus, he makes reparations and returns four times what he stole because Jesus went to his house and loved him. Um, and Jesus affirms that, that um, act of justice with salvation is coming to your house today. But then the exiles, um, those would be the sick, the people who society pushed out to the margins. Jesus approached with open hands. He touched them, and he welcomed, he healed them so they could be back in restored relationship and community. And so the beautiful thing about Jesus is he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what he was doing there in the Gospels, he's doing in the world around us right now. He's telling those those Pharisees, hush, and those voices are in me. I'm not talking about the other. Hush, where you're putting up barriers to people knowing their belovedness, hush, peace be still. 
and to those people who are being otherized through the isms that our society likes to put into place, racism, ageism, ableism, classism, the message that they're hearing in those isms is the image of God isn't as real as in you as it is in me. And of course, we know that's heresy. And Jesus says, welcome back in. Let me tell you, you're beloved. Let me touch you and heal you through my finished work on the cross and my victorious resurrection. And so it's been such a beautiful journey to wake up to the fact that Jesus was always with me. I didn't see him, but he was there. And as soon as I approached him with curiosity, he has shown me over and over again exactly where he's present and the work that he's doing. And he's doing it whether I join him or not, but he invites me to come along with him and do it. And so that's been, um, that's been where I've been the past six years, and that's where my feet are still going in the future. And I'm just so grateful for this church where, where these gifts can be flourished and called out. Um, I think it's really interesting that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and he didn't get peace be still from Jesus because he approached Jesus with curiosity. And he gets a conversation with Jesus that takes up most of John 3. And Jesus had patience with him because when we approach with curiosity, Jesus is gentle. And um, it's from uh, that conversation that we get the most famous gospel verse, John 3.16. We see it on, on plaques at ball games. But it was Jesus talking to Nicodemus, a curious Pharisee. And I love how it reads from the message. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger. Hush, you Pharisees. Telling the world how bad it is, he came to help, to put the world right again. Jesus came to restore relationship. He came to restore relationship from us to God, from us to ourselves, from us to the other, whether that other is a Christian brother or sister or somebody who has been otherized. And he even came to restore relationship to his beautiful creation. And so he loves us and he's putting the world to right and resting in that belovedness and in the confidence that God is at work putting the world right and turning our thoughts back to today's sermon Jesus, the boat, the storm, the mission of the inbreaking kingdom that can't be stopped. Let's be compassionately curious together. Let's open our hands together to where God is already working in our own lives. So I'd like you to ask yourself, what's the storm for me today? What are my struggles today? Maybe you're like me and you have managers in your head criticizing you. Or maybe firefighters obsessed with numbing through distraction. Or maybe hurting ex exiles that desperately need to be heard. Would you take a moment to close your eyes and just listen? Now, dear sisters and brothers, where's Jesus? Can you see him? inviting you onto the boat. And now as you're in the boat with Jesus, whatever your storm is, what's he saying to you? Listen for his loving, gentle voice. Maybe it'll be a song lyric, a scripture memory, a past experience, a picture, or maybe he'll just hold you in silence to comfort and love you. Maybe it's a peace be still. I'll give you just a minute to be present with Jesus in your storm, whatever that looks like for you, and then I'll close in prayer. Mighty Jesus, who speaks a word of peace to calm our troubled sea, Caring Jesus, who moves us from fear to faith. Surprising Jesus, who fills us with awe and also raises many questions. Always present Jesus, who never, ever leaves us alone. 
give us compassionate curiosity to sail with you to unknown places in the confidence that you are always with us and you delight in us. Open our hands to release what we are clinging to that is not from you.